By now, those of you with a Oculus Quest or an Oculus Go have might have seen our eight-part maker series called Tested VR. This was a, uh, an eight-part series that we shot with eight different makers across the country using a variety of new production tools and techniques, including this little guy here. This is the Zcam K1 Pro. This was our camera. This was the camera that we used on this series. Now, you might have seen a video I just shot uh, where we uh, rigged the camera up and showed how we prepare it for production. Um, but for this video, I really just wanted to talk about the camera itself and maybe answer a few questions that we got during that last video. So what is this camera? It's almost like two cameras. There's two lenses uh, going into two different sensors, copying to two different SD cards. Now, each of these lenses is, a, uh, uh, is fixed at 2.5 aperture. Now, in the previous models and the future models, you can actually change the aperture um, as long as you keep them uh, identical to each other. But for this model, they didn't have any aperture control whatsoever. They're essentially each capturing a 2880 fisheye image uh, that is then processed through the cards and stitched together using Zcam's free Wonder Stitch software. Every camera has a serial that interacts with the software so it knows exactly how to calibrate it. And when stitched together, it essentially creates one 5.7K video file. That's what we shot and edited in is the 5.7K and then eventually delivering that to the Oculus Quest. And this kind of leads into one of the questions that we got on the last video is, why not 360? Why didn't we shoot 360? Well, there's a variety of reasons, but uh, one of the main ones can all be kind of reduced down to quality. When you're shooting in 360, you're essentially sharing quality. You're sharing resolution. Um, the encode and decode becomes a little bit trickier because you have double the data there. Uh, so file sizes become a lot bigger. Um, essentially, we chose to have higher quality 180 stereo video in front of you than having uh, a bunch of data behind you that's just kind of wasted or lost that you might not even end up focusing on for most of the video. Also, the way that Norm and I were handling uh, the production of these videos was that we were oftentimes right behind the camera interacting with the person who's being filmed. We felt that there was much more organic, natural experience if they had someone to talk to, if they had someone to brainstorm off of, we can go back and forth, feed questions here and there. Um, chat a little bit and then get rolling. We couldn't do that with 360. We couldn't be there. We couldn't be the human element um, that these people can chat with. With 360, you really just gotta hit record and run away, uh, run to another room uh, and maybe watch monitors or have a headset on so you can hear things. Um, it's a little bit trickier of a production. So we decided just to hang up behind the camera and make ourselves available to the makers. Now for the physical camera, the interfacing of this camera, that's pretty bare bone. If you see, it's just mostly it's just two lenses and a little box. You do have a, a very light LCD menu here. This whole area is really just used for starting and stopping recording manually. And there is a Wi-Fi antenna spot here and it throws out a signal that you can then access with the computer or iPad and then control the camera completely through there. You can start and stop recording through there, do all your settings, your white balance, anything you really wanna do, you access it through an app, through the Zcam software. You have your two SD card slots on here. You have your ethernet here. You can actually power this camera through a switch if you want. There's a Limo power tap here. It comes with uh, it comes with a Limo to D-tap, which is how we use it. But if you want for this camera, the K1 Pro, you have to buy your battery plate separate. It has that Limo connector. And then ours uses like a Sony plate. Uh, if you want to make your rig smaller, you can just power it like that. Um, there's no internal ND. There's no NDs built in, which would have been nice because you can't really just throw an ND filter over these lenses. Um, it just, it sees too much, there's too much going on. Uh, you can't just put a sheet in front, obviously, because you'll see the square. Uh, so internal NDs would've been great, because um, for example, on Griffin Ramsey's shoot, we were essentially outside for most of the time in the bright Texas sun, and we had to do all of our exposure adjustments essentially through like a shutter. We dropped the ice, it was down as low can go. Uh, obviously we can't adjust the aperture, so we just used the shutter and sped that shutter way up, and so, uh, you notice that some of the, in the motion, you can really see there is essentially no motion blur. That's not really how I would like to adjust my exposure. I would have liked to have an internal MD that I can just flip on. Hopefully that will be something included in, in models in the future. So there are some things to note. First off, things are in kind of weird places. The powers are at the bottom uh, where a tripod plate goes, making it a little tough. And you know you have to really make sure that you have clearance uh, here and there for your cables. Secondly, the tools. There's no real display tools built in here. The the outputs that you get to your app where you can see your image, you can frame up your image, doesn't have anything else built in. No histograms, no uh, digital leveling, because it's very important that you have this leveled 
um, which we used uh, physical levels uh, attached to different parts of the rig to make sure things weren't cockeyed so that people aren't seeing things weird. Uh, so a digital level would have been great, some, some like uh, exposure assist, zebras. It's hard to see exactly what's being blown out. Some simple tools like that would have really sped up the process so I didn't have to be using light meters and color meters constantly. I could have had something to assist me there. Some people did ask about why there was so much empty space on the rig, why it was so long and cumbersome. It wasn't just for all the stuff that we had on it, because you, you did notice that there are two rails kind of pushing everything out. And I think I mentioned this briefly in the video, but this camera sees 180, not just left and right, com you know, completely to the sides of the camera, but up and down. And so when we put this on a tripod, if you were just sitting at the base of a tripod, you would see two giant legs when, you're, when you look down in the final product. So what we were doing was, we designed the rig to just push it out far enough so that we didn't have to worry about the tripod legs. We can spread the legs out, mount the camera, and we can be, uh, we can be assured that the camera wasn't going to be seeing that stuff down below. And then we had everything else pushed to the back for counterweight and counterbalance. And it, you know, it didn't make it the whole rig heavier, but again, um, it was all there to stop us from doing a potential issue, stop us from doing a mistake that we would have um, you know, gotten to post and been, oh, oh no, we can see the tripod legs, and, and I would have had to spend a lot of time in post masking things out. But you can definitely get away with throwing this on a smaller rack. The first uh, first episode we did, we just used uh, was an RSS rail, and basically just had a rail coming out here with the tripod plate, and then uh, the audio stuff right here. And that rig was very small. If you have you know the battery plate here, you don't need to deal with the big Anton Bauer or Sony V mount batteries. You can totally do that, and that's uh, a pretty lightweight, portable uh, travel rig if you want to do it that way. So now jumping into the quality of the image. Now it's hard for me to gauge because I haven't played with enough VR cameras. I think this is like the second. Um, and so there's a whole line of uh, VR cameras that are yeah, producing different quality, different sharpness, different distances. So it's, it's hard for me to really give a definitive, this is better than this, yada, yada. Um, what I can say is that it did produce a, a very clear, sharp image in the a very large circumference of the stereo image right in front of you. So when you're put on headsets, everything in front of you and um, a good distance away from you is very clean and sharp. And then the 3D is very convincing, in my opinion. And as you kind of look to the left and the right, you'll notice that the, the quality starts to just soften up a little bit. The edge is starting to soft up a little bit. It peaks in quality right in front. It is H.264, H.265, and I wouldn't trust coloring it to a huge extent. I know there's like Z-Log, which is Z-Cam's uh, log format, which we were advised not to use. So I didn't really touch it too much, but I just don't know if there is enough data to push and pull color that much. I did very light color tweaking and grading here and there. Um, there are a few color casts that came in. Uh, we were dealing with a lot of different light sources, daylights, fluorescent, shop lights. And so I had to kind of target colors here and there and, and, and mute them or reduce them. There was probably one issue, I think, where I had to jump out to DaVinci Resolve and really target certain areas of the room and then grade that way and then export out of ProRes. And that was probably the most I had to do. So now let's talk about the software. Uh, before we get to Adobe Premiere Pro, you had to stitch everything using the Zcam Wonderstitch software. Now, like I said, it pulls out the serial number from these cameras and knows how to calibrate those stereo images to give you something uh, that's super pleasing. But that software oftentimes is a little bit finicky. It didn't really work on Macs uh, very well at all. I didn't use it on my Mac because it, it wasn't stitching. Uh, so my, I jumped to my PC, I loaded it there, um, but I had issues in it only running once per install. So I'd install it, it would open, I'd stitch. If I closed it again, it wouldn't, it wouldn't open again. Uh, so I have to uninstall and then reinstall. It, was, it took 20 seconds every time I came back from a project, but it was just a little bit of a pain and you kind of wanted this stuff to be a little more solid uh, in the construction. So I think out of all this stuff, the software is where, where it just felt a little bit too janky. Uh, I think it needs to be tweaked and smoothed out a little bit for future iterations. And hopefully that stuff will, will come with the new K2 release. So once everything's done stitching, you essentially have one file that has the 20, two 2880 eyes put together. And you have to kind of, practice some good media management because it's essentially is destructive to the file name. So if you want to keep your raw files and uh, know where those go in relation to the stitch files, you have to do some, some folder naming and some, uh, some adjustment just to make sure everything, everything is there. But once you have that, you're essentially ready to go into Adobe Premiere. And that's how I edit this was Adobe Premiere. Uh, and if you haven't seen them already, there are tools already built into there. Premiere has ways of displaying the stereo image to give you uh, one eye that you can move around and you can edit that way. 
uh, you can edit in the stereo mode and just kind of focus on one half of the screen. Um, I essentially did all of my rough edits using the stereo mode, and then I'd jump into uh, the single eye and kind of watch it through there. Uh, and then I got a headset to use as live view. Now Adobe has the ability to do a live view out to a Vive or an Oculus Rift so that you can check your stuff there. And that was a game changer. When I got that headset set up, I was able to do my color correction in there. Um, I can add titles, graphics, picture in picture. Now Adobe has tools called uh, like VR immersive tools that essentially allow you to take 2D images and project them into this uh, into this 3D space. And it's really hard to make adjustments without being able to see it. Before, I would make adjustments, export out a still into an Oculus Go, uh, look at the Go, make adjustments, export another still, and keep doing that until I got something right. With the live view in the Rift, I can just dot, I can just put the headset on and dial things as I needed and see it all in real time. Total game changer. But those tools are available in Adobe Premiere now. So if you are have any interest in um, and just seeing what that post-production workflow is like, you can probably download some sample stereo images. Uh, and if you have a headset, I definitely recommend throwing it in there. It is pretty cool being able to edit with a live view of a headset. Going from there, then you can throw it out to Adobe Media Encoder, which you can then tell it this video is VR, and then export out a file in any kind of flavor that you want. But I am jumping ahead of myself because there was a whole giant step in there that I didn't talk about, and that was the audio editing. That was a huge challenge, and that is a whole separate video because that was probably about half of this workflow was uh, working with uh, ambisonic microphones but then also tracking tracking audio sources around the 3d space or around the um the 180 space it was very challenging at first but then a lot of fun to work with later on down the line we can talk about that more in the future we don't need to have that here but if you are interested in learning more about this production uh, in particular i did a big write-up over at the oculus blog post which we will link below um, where i go into a little more detail on the day-to-day -day of how we handled this stuff and how we approached this whole project. Um, so again, you guys, this is the, this is the Zcam K1 Pro. This is the camera that shot tested VR. Lots of fun to work with. If you have any questions, throw them below. I'll try to answer those. And um, thank you again for watching. Have fun and we'll see you next time. Bye.